Hello, hello! Welcome to another episode of History in the Dark. I am your host, Darkness the Curse. And before we begin, as always, thank you so much to my generous patrons, my British rail critics, and of course, my underwater train finders. You are the reason why this content remains unsinkable. And today, we are going to discuss a U.S. naval ship that for a while was known as the ship that wouldn't sink. This is the story of the USS Nevada. USS Nevada, or BB-36, was actually the third United States Navy ship to be named after the 36th state, Nevada. And she was the lead ship of the Nevada class of battleship. Alongside her sister, Oklahoma, they were the first US Navy standard type battleships. It took advantage of triple gun turrets, oil in place of coal for fuel, geared steam turbines for their drive that could provide greater range, as well as the all-or-nothing armor principle. This principle basically means that most, if not all, of the armor is concentrated around the critical parts of the ship. This means it's very difficult to actually disable or sink the boat, while non-critical areas receive next to no armor. It sounds weird, but it was proven to be kind of effective, at least back then. Well, the Nevada took a while to be able to really show her stuff. She was an impressive boat for her time, obviously. Ordered on the 4th of March, 1911, laid down on the 4th of November, 1912, and officially launched on the 11th of July, 1914. She was finally commissioned by the 11th of March, 1916, and did participate with the United States' entry into World War I. However, much like the Utah, she didn't really wind up doing much to anything during that war. She actually worked with her sister Oklahoma and the Utah as a part of the Bantry Bay Squadron, unofficially. Officially, they were Battleship Division 6, but that's not nearly as fun a name. And they were under the command of Rear Admiral Thomas S. Rogers. Utah was his flagship, and the job was to escort large convoys bound for the British Isles to ensure that no German heavy surface ships could actually, you know, blow them up. But by that point in World War I, there wasn't a lot of naval conflict, and the Nevada didn't see any action during that war. During the interwar period, she was given some upgrades and operated mostly as an escort for VIPs and things of that nature. Nothing particularly exciting happened during this time, though she did wind up as a part of the Pacific Fleet during that era. And that brings us to December 6, 1941. It was a Saturday, and all the Pacific Fleet's battleships were in port for the weekend for the first time since the 4th of July. Under normal circumstances, they actually took turns spending time in port. Six would be out at a time with Vice Admiral William S. Pye's Battleship Task Force 1. Three others would be sent out with Vice Admiral William Halsey Jr.'s Aircraft Carrier Task Force. But because Halsey could not afford to take the slower battleships with his fast carriers on his dash to reinforce Wake Island's Marine Detachment, and because it was Pye's turn to rest in port, none of the battleships were sailing on that morning. And when the sun came up over the Nevada on the 7th, the ship's band began playing morning colors. But then planes appeared on the horizon, and the attack on Pearl Harbor began. Now, Nevada's position was actually rather unique compared to the rest of the battleships in Battleship Row that day. She was not moored alongside another battleship off Ford Island at the time. So unlike all the rest, she was able to maneuver. Her commanding officer, Francis W. Scanland, was actually ashore when the attack began. The officer on deck was one Ensign Joe Tossig. Tossig was a disciplined fellow and very critical when it came to efficiency. He had earlier that morning already ordered that a second of Nevada boilers fired. The reason for this is that he planned on switching the power load from one boiler to the other, around 800. But when the attack happened, this meant that Nevada actually had two of her boilers going. Tossig was also generally in charge of the anti-aircraft batteries on board the Nevada, and they were able to get a hold of some ammo and start firing. Her engineers raised the steam pressure, but before she could really get underway, a single 18-inch Type 91 Mod 2 torpedo slammed into her against Frame 41, about 14 feet above the keel at 810. It had been dropped by a Kate torpedo bomber, or a Nakajima B-5N, but the same bomber that dropped the torpedo was then shot down by Nevada's gunners. 
the torpedo bulkhead held, the leaking began through the joints and that caused flooding on the port side, causing a list of about 4 to 5 degrees. Damage control corrected the list by counter flooding and Nevada got underway by 840. Her gunners by that point had shot down four planes. All this was partially due to Tossig's efficiency, but he was wounded in the attack and actually refused to leave his post until he was physically dragged away by his own men. Which would be funny if not for the fact that his wounds were bad enough that he wound up having one of his legs amputated. When the second attack wave arrived, Nevada became a prime target because she was the one battleship that was moving. The Val Dive Bombers, also known as Aichi D-3A Type 99 Carrier Bombers, began attempting to hit her with their ordnance, partially because they thought they could block the channel and therefore seal the harbor off if they sank her. But target selection was wrong about this for a variety of reasons. For one thing, the Dive Bombers attacking her would have basically no chance of sinking a battleship like this with their 250 kilogram bombs. They just weren't gonna be enough. On top of that, the channel had a width of 1,200 feet. The Nevada alone would not be enough to block the harbor off. But still, they attacked anyway. She steamed past 1010 dock at about 0950 and was struck by five bombs. One hit the crew galley, another the port director platform, yet another one hit near the number one turret inboard from the port waterway, and two of them struck the forecastle near frame 15. One passed through the other side of the second deck before exploding, but the other exploded within the ship near the gasoline tank. This was really bad because leakage and vapors from this tank cause intense fires around the ship. And this in particular probably would have caused way more critical damage if not for the fact that Nevada's main magazines for her big guns had been empty at the time. The reason for this is that all the battleships were in the process of exchanging out their standard weight main battery projectiles for new heavier projectiles that offered greater penetration. All of the old projectiles and powder charges had been removed from the magazines of Nevada at the time. And the crew had taken a break after loading the new projectiles in anticipation of loading the new powder charges on Sunday. They never got around to this before the attack happened, so Nevada was likely spared from a very devastating explosion. Despite the bombs not really being able to sink Nevada outright, she was starting to take on water from being repeatedly pelted with the things and they were worried she would sink in deeper water and not be able to be raised like many of the other battleships would be. So instead, she was ordered to be grounded off Hospital Point at 10.30. To accomplish this, she was helped by a tugboat called Hoga, as well as a minesweeper called Avocat. And even before she did that, she forced down three more planes. Once she was safely grounded, damage control continued to try to deal with the flooding, but the gasoline fires prevented them from containing it forward of the main torpedo defense system. The flooding of the main magazine and counter-flooding to keep the ship stable lowered the bow, allowing water to enter the ship at the second deck level. Nevada had a lack of watertight subdivision between the second and main decks from frame 30 to frame 115, and this allowed water that was entering through the bomb holes in the forecastle to flow aft through the ship's ventilation system and to flood the dynamo and boiler rooms. As a result, despite being grounded, she slipped off and partially sank, but could easily be refloated later. 60 men on board her had been killed, and 109 had been wounded. Even during the recovery operation, two more died on the 7th of February 1942, when they were overcome by hydrogen sulfide gas from decomposing paper and meat on board the Nevada. At minimum, she absorbed six bomb hits and at least one torpedo hit, but it's believed that as many as 10 bomb hits could have been received. However, by the 12th of February 1942, under the command of Captain L. Thompson, Nevada was refloated and underwent temporary repairs at Pearl Harbor so she could get to Puget Sound Navy Yard for major repairs and modernization. She again received a new captain, Howard F. Kingman, and the entire overhaul was completed in October 1942. And it sufficiently changed her appearance, so she slightly resembled a South Dakota class from a distance. On the 25th of January 1943, she was given another new captain, Willard A. Kitts, and she sailed for Alaska, where she provided fire support from the 11th to the 18th of May 1943 for the capture of Attu which is a story that's often overlooked when it comes to the overall battles of World War II, but it's an interesting one I might talk about some other time. After that, Nevada departed for Norfolk Navy Yard in June for further modernization. Now, Nevada was an older style battleship, obviously, and it was thought she might be better served in the Atlantic Theater when compared to the Pacific. 
so she was sent over there for convoy duty to guard against the chance that a German capital ship might head out to sea on a raiding mission. Kind of like what the Bismarck tried to do and did it. She did a ton of convoy runs, and then she sailed for the United Kingdom to prepare for the Normandy invasion, D-Day, arriving in April 1944, with Captain Pal M. Rhea in command. Her floatplane artillery observer pilots were temporarily reassigned to Voss 7 and flew Spitfires with the Royal Navy, which had to be an interesting change of pace for them. Rear Admiral Morton Dio wound up choosing the Nevada as flagship for the D-Day operation. During the invasion, Nevada was to support forces that were sent ashore by firing volleys from her main guns against shore defenses on the Cherbourg Peninsula. The shells from her guns were ranged as far as 17 nautical miles, and it was meant to break up German concentrations and counterattacks. She was actually straddled by counter-battery fire at least 27 times, but never took a hit. The ship was later praised for being incredibly accurate in her fire support, some of the targets she struck were just 600 yards from the front lines. Additionally, Nevada is recognized as the only battleship that was present at both Pearl Harbor and the Normandy landings. After that, she was sent to southern France, towards Toulon, for another amphibious assault that was codenamed Operation Dragoon. She was one of five battleships as part of this operation, alongside the Texas, Arkansas, the British Ramales, and the Free French Lorraine. There were also three heavy cruisers, Augusta, Tuscaloosa and Quincy, as well as a ton of destroyers and landing craft. From the 15th of August to the 25th of September, 1944, Nevada dueled with what the Allies called Big Willie. It was a reinforced fortress with four 340mm guns in two twin turrets. These guns had actually been taken from the French battleship Province after she was scuttled by the French fleet at Toulon. They had a range of nearly 19 nautical miles, and they were fortified with heavy armor plate embedded into the rocky sides of the island of St. Mandrier. Due to this problem, the fire support ships assigned to the operation were ordered to level that fortress. Beginning on the 19th of August and continuing through the subsequent days, one or more heavy warships bombarded the fortress in conjunction with low-level bomber strikes. In particular, on the 23rd, a bombardment force that was headed by the Nevada struck what was known as the most damaging blow to the fort during a six and a half hour battle. Nevada herself would fire 354 salvos during that time, and Toulon finally fell on the 25th. So the fort, despite being in absolute tatters, held out for another three days. After this impressive display, Nevada was told to head back to New York to have her gun barrels realigned. The three 14-inch slash 45 caliber guns of turret 1 were replaced with Mark 8 guns that were taken from one of the lost battleships of Pearl Harbor, Arizona. After this, she was sent back to the Pacific as the European conflict was slowly devolving into a land war and a heavy battleship like Nevada wouldn't be able to do much in. But the Pacific was still very much a naval conflict, and she arrived off Iwo Jima on the 16th of February 1945. She supported the invasion of Iwo Jima with heavy bombardments, and she moved to be within 600 yards from the shore to provide maximum firepower for the troops that kept advancing. On the 24th of March 1945, she joined Task Force 54 to supply more fire support off Okinawa. She shelled Japanese airfields, shore defenses, supply dumps, and troop concentrations, but by the night of the 24th of March, the support ships retired for the evening. It was only that morning that they were attacked by seven kamikaze planes. One plane, though it was hit repeatedly by anti-aircraft fire, crashed into the main deck of Nevada, next to turret number three. This impact killed 11 men and wounded 49. It knocked out both the 14-inch guns that were in that turret, as well as three 20mm anti-aircraft guns. Another two men were lost to fire from a shore battery on the 5th of April. Despite the damage, she remained offshore of Okinawa until the 30th of June, and then she departed to join the 3rd Fleet from the 10th of July to the 7th of August. This allowed Nevada, interestingly, to come within range of the Japanese home islands as the war drew to a close, but she never bombarded them for obvious reasons. She was used during occupation duty in Tokyo Bay briefly, and then returned with her final commanding officer, Captain Cecil C. Adele, to Pearl Harbor, where her journey in World War II had actually begun. She was surveyed, and at 32 and a half years old, 
she was simply deemed too old to be kept in the post-war fleet. As a result, much like the Utah, she was assigned to be a target ship, but not just any target ship. She was to be used in the first Bikini Atomic Experiments. These were some atomic bomb tests conducted by the United States between 1946 and 1958 on Bikini Atoll in the Marshall Islands. 23 nuclear weapons occurred at seven different test sites on the reef itself, on the sea, in the air, and underwater. The Nevada was to be a target for a nuclear bomb, as the military wanted to determine the effectiveness of the A-bomb versus ships. In addition, she was to be the target for the very first test, which was codenamed Abel, and used an air-dropped bomb. Nevada was painted a reddish-orange to make her very distinctive from the rest of the boats down there. However, there was a bit of a flub in dropping the ordnance, and the bomb fell about 1,700 yards, or 1,600 meters, off target, instead exploding above the attack transport Gilliam. Nevada wound up surviving an atomic bomb blast because of this, but then she would be used for the second test, Baker, which was a detonation some 90 feet below the surface of the water. You'd think taking two atomic bombs that exploded within spinning distance might actually sink the Nevada. Absolutely not. She remained afloat even after Baker, though she was damaged, and by this point, rather radioactive, which was not good. After that, they actually towed her back to Pearl Harbor and officially decommissioned her on the 29th of August, 1946. They did examine her a bit more after she managed to survive, I repeat this, two atomic bombs, and I assume they did this carefully because, you know, radiation. But afterwards, the Iowa, as well as two other vessels, used Nevada as a practice gunnery target 65 miles northwest of Pearl Harbor on the 31st of July, 1948. Despite this, apparently Nevada was not going anywhere because even fire from these ships still didn't sink her, and the Navy wound up giving her a coup de grace from an aerial torpedo that hit amidships. She slipped beneath the waves, as stubborn in death as she had been in life. One of her guns, the ones that were originally mounted on Arizona, are paired with a gun formerly on Missouri at the Wesley Bolin Memorial Plaza, just east of the Arizona State Capitol Complex in downtown Phoenix. It's part of a memorial representing the start and the end of the Pacific War for the United States. And on the 11th of May, 2020, it was announced that a joint expedition by Ocean Infinity, with its ship, the Pacific Constructor, and the Operations Center of Search Inc., headed by Dr. James Degato, had discovered Nevada's wreck. She's located at a depth of about 15,400 feet, or 4,700 meters, off the coast of Hawaii and about 65 nautical miles southwest of Pearl Harbor. She's upside down, with the main hull carrying scars of the shellfire and torpedo hits she absorbed. Nearby is a large debris field where her turrets lay, likely falling off the ship as she capsized, as well as the bow and the stern, both of which were torn free. Archaeologists also documented the two tripod masts, portions of the bridge, sections of the deck, and superstructure, and one of four tanks, as well as an M26 Pershing, placed on the deck for the atomic bomb tests. When she was found, the hull was still painted, and the number 36 was visible on the stern. It's perhaps a rather sad end for a ship that for a long time was viewed as the ship that wouldn't sink. And with that, a special thank you goes out to all my underwater train finders, Thomas Ward, Lord Captain Von Thrust III, Some Dude 267, Orange Glass, Joshua Long, Ohio Trucker 1, Row Hudson 2860, Lord Hoth 444, Arthur Roy, Benjamin Owens, Panzer Kitson 131-232, Mr. Black Rose, Tribal Typhoon, Master of None, Josh Johnson, and Lock Kraken. Till next time, this is Darkness, and I bid you all a fond farewell.